Brother Russ. Right. Y'all give yourselves a hand. This is encouraging this morning. It sounded great. Okay. Uh, we want to welcome Tony McBride back right here. Okay. Tony has been sleeping his, in his own bed now for three or four nights, I think. And it's uh, how many months was it that you weren't able to do that? 97. Now, it wasn't because Carol was really mad at him. <laughs> but it was a nerve thing. Okay. All right, y'all. This is a special speaker. We're going to get going right away. This man is amazing. The most amazing thing was somehow he convinced the beautiful and saintly Megan Michelle Estes, would you stand up? <laughs> To marry him. All right. All right. We're talking about Hal Craig. Matter of fact, this July they will be married 10 years. Is that right? Okay. Pretty good. Pretty good. They have produced three lovely daughters. Addison Lynn, Harper Rose, and Ashton Michelle. All right. What a memory. Well, what good notes. Now, the thing you may not know about Hal is he is one quarter Japanese. He didn't go into any detail about which quarter, but his grandmother was a Japanese. All right, that's why he wears uh, thong sandals most of the time. He did go to Auburn and took logistics. What's that? War Eagles. War Eagles, somebody said War Eagles, okay, all right. Then he was in logistics and trucking for about four years. He was in the restaurant business since he was 14, off and on. The man had three Mama Goldbergs. He, can you imagine that? All right. He's in Advocare, and that works for Cisco some of the time. Please help me welcome a man because he has three beautiful daughters who by the first grade, when the youngest is in the first grade, this man will have had his toenails painted more than 4,000 times. <laughs> Mr. Hal Craig. Come on up, Hal. <laughs> it's true. You know what? All right, good morning. He didn't give the caveat that um, today's lesson, he asked me on Thursday to do it because Blake Harris was teaching today, and as you know, they had their baby on Thursday. So he asked me, hey, can you teach? I said, sure. So today... Um, we had, I did this lesson for a Trace Diaz weekend, and I thought it was good, and it blessed me, and I want to just bless you with it. So I'm going to start with prayer. Father, I love you. I thank you for this glorious weekend you've given us with the weather. I thank you for this home church and what it means to our family. Um, I just want to pray that you be present this morning. Um, remove me. Speak through me um, with the thoughts that you have put on my heart to... Um, to just kind of share them today and just uh, hopefully bless others as you've blessed Megan and I with this lesson. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, I'm going to start with a video. So, because, yeah, kick it, Ben. Let's see if it starts. They'll be there too message will do. We edit and exaggerate, crave adulation. We pretend not to notice the social isolation. We put our words into order until our lives are glistening. We don't even know if anyone is listening. Being alone isn't a problem. Let me just emphasize, if you read a book, paint a picture, or do some exercise, you're being productive and present, not reserved and recluse. You're being awake and attentive and putting your time to good use. So when you're in public and you start to feel alone, put your hands behind your head, step away from the phone. You don't need to stare at your men, you or at your contact list. Just talk to one another, learn to coexist. I can't stand to hear the silence of a busy commuter train where no one wants to talk through the fear of looking insane. We're becoming unsocial. It no longer satisfies to engage with one another and look into someone's eyes. We're surrounded by children who, since they were born, have watched us living like robots and think it's the norm. It's not very likely you'll make world's greatest dad if you can't entertain a child without using an iPad. When I was a child, I'd never be home. Be out with my friends on our bikes, we'd roam. I'd wear holes in my trainers and graze up my knees. We'd build our own clubhouse high up in the trees. Now the park's so quiet, it gives me a chill. See no children outside and the swings hanging still. 
There's no skipping, no hopscotch, no church and no steeple. We're a generation of idiots, smartphones and dumb people. So look up from your phone, shut down, display. Take in your surroundings, make the most of today. Just one real connection is all it can take to show you the difference that being there can make. Be there in the moment that she gives you the look that you remember forever as when love overtook. The time she first holds your hand or first kiss your lips. The time you first disagree but still love her to bits. The time you don't have to tell hundreds of what you've just done because you want to share this moment with just this one. The time you'll sell your computer so you can buy a ring for the girl of your dreams who is now the real thing. The time you want to start a family and the moment when you first hold your little girl and get to fall in love again. The time she keeps you up at night and all you want is rest and the time you wipe away the tears as your baby flees the nest. The time your baby girl returns for a boy for you to hold and the time he calls you granddad and makes you feel real old. The time you take in all you've made just by giving life attention and how you're glad you didn't waste it by looking down at some invention. The time you hold your wife's hand, sit down beside her bed. You tell her that you love her, lay a kiss upon her head. She then whispers to you quietly as her heart gives a final beat that she's lucky she got stopped by that lost boy in the street. But none of these times ever happened. You never had any of this. When you're too busy looking down, you don't see the chances you miss. So look up from your phone, shut down those displays. We have a finite existence, a set number of days. Don't waste your life getting caught in the net, as when the end comes, nothing's worse than regret. I'm guilty too of being part of this machine, this digital world we are heard but not seen, where we type as we talk and we read as we chat where we spend hours together without making eye contact. So don't give in to a life where you follow the hype. Give people your love, don't give them your like. Disconnect from the need to be heard and defined. Go out into the world, leave distractions behind. Look up from your phone, shut down that display. Stop watching this video, live life the real way. So the other caveat to this is everything I'm going to share with you guys is for my life as well. So that's something we struggle with, I struggle with. And so today's lesson is about just being used in the kingdom, being in your environment. Um, and it's kind of neat because this is kind of what Brett just finished his lessons on, um, just being how you can be used in your environment. So um, Matthew 13, all right, it's up there. It says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him, and he got in a boat. Let's skip ahead. You know the story, but I like to read from it. A far farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And so today's lesson is about, I just, I've heard that story. Everyone in here has heard that story, that parable. But I had a thought, and I was talking to Justin about this yesterday. Um, what, were ha what would happen if you've got the seed that's on the path or the seed that's on the rocky soil or the seed that's in the thorny soil? And instead of just letting it grow up and die, you picked up the seed and replanted it in good soil. What would happen? Well, it's a whole, you know, because all the seeds are the same. So you're just giving that seed another chance. You're giving that seed a better opportunity to produce a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. So... Today's lesson is about having that opportunity to take that seed and just being, you know, replanting it in good soil. And so we're the seeds. And so it's going to be two parts. The first part is preparing ourselves for our daily environment, I guess you could call it. Um, and then the second part is what we do once we're prepared and we're in there. And so I started thinking, like, why? And you can go to the next slide, Ben. You know, why is this important? And in, in starting doing the math, 
you know, you sleep, you're in church supposedly three hours a week. You know, there's some people who are in church a lot more than three hours a week, but roughly three hours a week. You're sleeping for 50 hours. So all the rest of the time, 70% of your life, of your day, is opportunity. You're going to be around um, family, job, hobbies, um, anywhere where you're interacting with people, that is your environment. That is where you're going to be able to influence and be used for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So I think it's real important that we're ready and we're not ill-prepared for when we're in that environment. So again, first part is getting ready. Second part is what we do when we get there. So to get ready, I tried and I researched and I looked and I tried to find a better example, but I had and I was forced, and even Megan is making fun of me for it, but there's not a better example of, about getting ready than Nick Saban. Nick Saban is legit. He's really, really good. I say that as an Auburn grad. I love my Tigers, but there's not a better example of someone who puts in preparation, plans, prepares, and then he goes out and to his environment, the game, and it doesn't matter who it is or who he's playing, nine times out of ten, he's going to win because he's ready for it. And again, I hate it. I try to find a better example, but um, <laughs> um, he does really good. So how do we get prepared for the opportunity, that 70%? Okay, there's three things. One, prayer. I think you can go to the next slide. Okay. Prayer. Um, and this one, again, everything I'm going to tell you is for me too. So what is your prayer life like? And you may be where you have to, I don't know, for me, it was kind of had to look in the mirror and go, what is my prayer life like? Is it just praying before meals, praying before I go home to go to, or go to bed? What is your prayer life like? Um, I've been, I'm real big with, I think, a lot of spiritual warfare and I think that we're in a spiritual war. And so my idea behind and the thought behind it is, you know, the commander in chief, if you're not in direct communication with him in this war, you're going to be ill prepared. You're not going to have the tools it takes to, to make this fight. So um, prayer's big. And I'll tell you this, two things. One, if you're struggling with prayer and you don't, maybe you don't know you're struggling with prayer, but if you don't feel like your prayer life's good, start simple. Start praying prayers of thanks. Wake up in the morning and just thank God for family. Thank God for a roof over your head. Thank God for um, the fact that you have money to pay the bills. Thank God for that you were able to eat. Um, the second thing, and this is kind of a little just off, but I'm just an advocate for it because I thought it was really good. But has anyone seen the movie The War Room? Okay. If you haven't seen it, that's your homework. Go watch it. It's really, really good. But one of the things they do in there is they have a, a place in the house that's designated for prayer. Because a lot of times our excuses, like Russ was saying, we have three kids. Well, I don't have time to have quiet time. You know, I've got three kids who are constantly wanting to have our attention. And so in the movie, she has a closet, and it's called her war room, her prayer room. And she goes in there, and, and she um, that's when she has her prayer time. And so it's really cool because... Megan, I came home one day, and she turned our closet into a war room. <laughs> and we don't have a big closet. It's a little one. But she put scripture up and our prayer list and um, put our devotional books. And that's our time when we try to have a designated time. But even if not, if we know we're having a stressful after, afternoon or morning, we can just say, hey, go in there and have some quiet time. And it just makes things better. But it does help with um, learning how to pray. All right, the second thing, study. Very similar to what Brett's lesson was this morning. You know, we've got to, yes, you can rely on the Holy Spirit to speak through you and give you the tools you need, but we have to study too. We have to add that. So, again, we used the excuse before, well, I've got three kids. I don't have time for study. I've got work and, you know, but like, again, Nick Saban, the process, this is part of the process. You have to get in the Word. You have to study. So, in order to do that for us... It was the war room again, the prayer room. That's where we have our devotional books. That's where we can go in and not only pray, but that's where we study. So try to find a time that you can study. And then something that kind of just, um, it just convicted me, but I would ask you very similar again what Brett taught last week. At the end of the day when you're going to sleep, just kind of take a recollection of your day and just say, 
you know, were you, did you spend more time in watching TV, on Facebook, in the computer, playing video games, or were you in the Word, studying, trying to get closer and build your relationship with God? And that's between you and him. I mean, for me, it was, there's a lot of times where I, that hasn't. It's, I've gone to bed going, man, I, you know, it used to be a long time, or a couple of years ago, it was like, I played Candy Crush more than I got in the Word, so I had to delete that game. So, but that's between you and God. You just find yourself at the end of the day, like, we all have the same 24 hours. It's just a matter of being intentional what you're going to put your time in. Okay? And then the third is fellowship. Who are you hanging around? Who's building you up? Who's pouring into you? Um, something cool that I found a few years ago, and I found it to be true, you are the average of the five people you hang around with the most. So... And that's so true. I've seen it in our, my own life. I've seen it done before in other people's lives. But look around. Who are you hanging around with the most? You're going to find over time that your salaries are going to be very similar. Your interests are going to be very similar. You know, your taste of clothes are going to be very similar. It's going it's, to, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. But you find that you're, you, you get closer together and you become like that person. So um, who are the five people you hang around with the most? The other part of fellowship as you prepare to be used in your environment is accountability. You know, do you have the courage or do you have that person who can tell you when you're not in the right place? Um, you know, they say iron sharpens iron. So, you know, just look, take a self-evaluation of who your friends are, who you're around, and that's something you may have to, um, I don't know, you just want to make sure you have good fellowship. That's something that's, it's part of the process. You just got to do it. <laughs> um, I know it has been in our life. Any psychologists out there? Anybody who's in psychology? Because I'm about to act like I know what I'm talking about. Okay, cool. All right, so in this process, there's four stages. And when you learn something or want to do something well, there's four stages. And again, these are from a psychologist book I just but it sounded really good and it makes sense to me so I'm going to share them um, stage one is you are unconsciously incompetent which means you don't know that you don't know what you're doing and that was me for a lot of those things I didn't realize that I wasn't studying enough I didn't realize that I wasn't that my prayer life wasn't good I didn't realize that my fellowship wasn't good. You don't realize that you're not doing it. So you just, you're, you're ignorant to it. You just keep doing it. Um, the second stage, as you realize it, is consciously incompetent. So hopefully after this, you, some of you will be consciously incompetent. That's where I'm, where you know, okay, I need to do better at that. I know I need to pray more. I know I need to study more. I know I need to change fellowship. You're still not good at it. But you at least are aware of it, and you can, you're starting to work towards it. Um, third is um, consciously competent, which means you know, and you're getting good at it as long as you're intentional with it. Okay, I've scheduled it in my phone, prayer time. I've scheduled it in my phone, study time. I'm doing it. And you're doing the right things, and you know you're supposed to be doing the right things. That's consciously competent. And that's good. That's real good. That's where we need to be. But the last thing is ultimately where you want to be. And this is when you, be, when you find people who are masters of their trade. They are unconsciously competent, meaning without even realizing it, they're doing it. They're driving down the road, and they just start praying. They they're in the doctor's office. Instead of grabbing the magazine, they open up the Bible to study. They just realize, you know, they, does that make sense? You just don't realize it, but you're doing it because you've done it so much. And that's kind of the goal with these three things. Prayer, study, fellowship. If you, again, we'll call it the Nick Saban process method, but you keep working on those three things enough, you become unconsciously competent where you are prepared. So when you're in your environment, when you're in your community, you're in your hobby, you're in your workforce, you can be used by God in a mighty way. All right? So now that we're prepared, we're going to just assume now everybody is unconsciously, unconsciously competent, and we are all ready to go. So what do we do? So next slide, Ben. Next. Okay. So you just need to be an example to people. Um, you know, I put the term up there, WWJD. You know, Jesus was a very popular person. 
He was unpopular in a lot of ways too, but people were drawn to him. They wanted to come hear him speak. They wanted to come see what he was doing. So I use that, be an example of Jesus, because people will be drawn to you. You know, and again, if you're not sure how to be an example of Jesus, just go read the Gospels and just keep reading them and you'll become unconsciously competent of what Jesus was doing. Um, but you want to be an example to people. Uh, the second thing is meeting others where they're at. And this one is a struggle for me. It's a, um, but basically, it's, it's easy to love people who agree with everything you agree with. You know, is that, is that true? Those are the ones that are easy to love. It's hard to love people or to be kind to or to be that example to, to people who are constantly disagreeing with you, constantly arguing with you. That, those are the hard ones. An example that's, again, been on my heart for this was right now in this stage, you're going to have an opportunity to be in an environment of politics, whether it's on social media, whether it's at work, whether it's where people are going to get into the discussion of politics, and that will be your environment. You will be in that situation. So how are you going to react? You know, my view on it, and this may be different than other people's, but my view is, you know, I know what I believe in, and there's a lot of people I disagree with. I disagree wholeheartedly with some people with what they're saying, but I have two choices. I could go in and start an argument, and you know, depending on how they were going to take that argument, may I may lose my influence with them, but I may be right. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you've won the argument, but you really lost? You know, you've won, but you may have lost the relationship, so you really lost, even though you know, you, I won, I got it. But then you're never talking to that person again. You know, the example that God put on my heart this morning was when we saw, sang that song, he could have called 10,000 angels. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he knew he was right. He knew the other ones were wrong. <laughs> like, in, he, he's like, he could have called 10,000 angels because he was right and he could have won that argument but he would have lost for us and we would have lost. So he humbled himself, realized he was right, but treated it in such a way that he still won the argument. So meet others where they're at. Number three, when you're in your environment, again, your hobby, your business job, accept the fact that you're a leader. You know, um, it's not okay to stand on the sidelines. Last time I was able to teach this class, we, we taught on like leadership. and. I hopefully showed that everyone in here is called to be a leader. It's not okay to not be. Now, there's different types of leadership. You may not be the, the general, vocal, you know, do this, do this, do this. But there's different types of leadership where people are influenced by your actions and they want to be led by you. Um, just as an example, this is a silly example, but it, it's so funny watching, especially in a church setting. Um, people are craving to be led and told. So when you leave here, people are going to go, we're, the four of us will probably say this. Where should we go eat lunch? I don't know where you want to go. I don't know where you want to go. You pick. I don't know where you want to go. If somebody will st just get, you know what, we're going to Taco Casa. You know, I didn't want to go to Taco Casa, but because that person stood up and said something, I'm going to go with them because I didn't. You know what I'm saying? Now, that's a silly example about food, but think of it in spiritual life, too. People are craving, you know, if some, if a group of people are all gossiping around somebody, yeah, it's hard to do, but you stand up and say, you know what, let's not do that, because you wouldn't want everybody to gossip around you too, and that's hard, and it's awkward, and it's putting yourself out there, but I think they will, you know, they'll value that. They may not be valuing it at that moment, they'll value that. They want to be, they're looking for that. This country's craving for that. Um, you know, just, and then another viewpoint of how, not a viewpoint of anybody else, but, you know, the, we're not going to fix this country with the president, with the Senate, with the Congress. We're going to fix the country starting here with people being leaders in their communities, in their small groups, in their, again, I use hobbies, their sports events. If we have people in the church who go out and be Jesus and be leaders, the communities will change, the cities will change. The states will change, and we will. That's how this country is going to get fixed. It's not going to be whoever is elected. So, that's one of those where it's just it doesn't matter. And then the last thing is it doesn't happen overnight. So, you want to make an impact in your community. You want to be the person you've been called to be. But, you know, sometimes, especially me, like I get discouraged. I go out gung ho. I'm like, let's do this, and then it doesn't happen. 
you know. But what you have to know is you're planting seeds and you are making an impact and it's gonna be, it doesn't happen overnight. Again, I'll go back to the whole Nick Saban example. Wh who remembers when he first came to Alabama? What was his record his first year? One good. Th then he lose to somebody like, then he yeah, Law Tech or UAB or something. He lost somebody that was like, you would think, why did he lose to that school? And there were probably people upset with him. But you know what? Again, Nick Saban, I'm gonna sound like an up, but he stayed the course. He stayed the course. He did what he knew he was supposed to do. He didn't listen to the critics. He kept doing the right thing, and now look at him. He's you know one of the top coaches of all time. He, he stayed the course. So it doesn't happen overnight.